All right. Hello, Fortinos brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is July 29th, and you know what that means. In a fortnight. Yeah, that's probably what tonight's teaching is going to be called. Not uh, because it's going to explain what the teaching is going to be about, but because in 14 days, brothers and sisters, the time is at hand. We have some exciting stuff to get into tonight. We are going to be touching a lot on on the priestly line. Uh, a lot of people have been asking me questions about the seven days. You know, is are we really going to be waiting seven days? Are we going to be, is it possible we can be taken and go to the wedding for seven days and then come back with the Lord? And I've said, well, maybe there's a possibility like John at Patmos, you know, in Revelation. And he was taken in the spirit and saw these things, but our bodies remained here. Um, I, I don't know that any of that is necessarily the way it's going to go. I believe Luke chapter 12 really helps us understand. However, what we're going to see tonight will bring clear clarity to that point again here tonight that will show what I believe proves that the the remnant bride, that that remnant priestly line that remains to serve during seals, that waits for him when he returns from the wedding, that will be with the Son of Man for 40 days, is going to remain. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to get into some exciting things. It's, man, can you imagine? We were only three more videos. Well, this video, this teaching here tonight, and two more. And we're at the end. We're at the end. It's so crazy exciting. It's hard to believe. I've been talking with a number of people lately. New people have reached out, which is always so awesome and so exciting. Some that have followed for a while. Uh, a brother, our brother Bill, I spoke to, I think it was yesterday. Um, just <clears throat> exciting to know some some stories, like the background that so many brothers and sisters have. It's absolutely incredible to to hear their their witness, their story of the Lord and how He's worked in their lives. We've got people here in this ministry being prepared not only to preach and to teach. Like like I told like I told him and I was telling my wife afterwards, some will stand on hillsides and there will be thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands gathered, and they will be teaching them, they will be preaching and prophesying from there. Some will go out into the streets and will be gathering people and bringing them. Others will be fighting spiritual battles. Others will be working with women and with children and preparing them and working with them. This is a ministry that I'm telling you is preparing a remnant group. It is absolutely wild to see how it's all coming together, let alone what is going on in the world confirming all of these things for us in the season and time. We stick with Scripture, though. This is all about Scripture, and we put a little 1% or 2% of, of events that are going on in the world uh, from AI to to historical tracking data, to the events happening in our day and age. <laughs> Excuse me. It is everywhere. It is so incredible. And we, when you understand the 70 years, the differences in the Gospels, the 14 years of tribulation, when you put all of this stuff together, the harvests, when they take place, where it's counted from, how it's connected to the 40 days of the Son of Man, it it's so wild it's so wild that it really really looks like it's all here everything is lined up everything and you're gonna see tonight you know i knew there was a reason being spiritually led to wait about doing this last video that's weak in the number of views because most people just think, oh, baptism, blah, blah, blah. Man, I'm telling you, there was a reason I held off till late in the game. So that more people would come in. Like a new brother and his wife that just came in. A new brother and sister that just came across the ministry just in the last week or three weeks or something like that. And when he started watching the intros, it blew his mind. And that's how I knew he was meant to find it you know when we share these revelations with people and they're like eh, 
Yeah, I don't think so. I've only only ever heard seven years. What are you talking about who the Gospels are speaking to? Those who have been seeking and searching and those who the Spirit has prepared. That's who it's meant for. And those who are meant to hear will be led even right to the last day. That final moment, something will click. They will see something that will come to one of the playlists and it'll click. One thing. Watch that one intro and bam, it begins. They'll be ready. They will have suddenly understood. And that brother with Stephen is a great example of that happening. So before I go into everything, I'm going to do what I always do. Share with you guys the playlist and now you see why. You can understand. Our brother Stephen understands it, right? Brand new. And why do I always speak about this playlist? Because it is the key. It is the key to understanding the revelation that's been happening here for almost seven years. Everybody who's new or hasn't yet watched this, come to this intro series playlist right here or go to ministryrevealed.com from here. And at ministryrevealed.com, you can click on the menu, click on intro, and watch the first four teachings. The first one is a 22-minute intro of what the next three are going to talk about. So it'll just give you a light little, you know, ease you in to what you're about to hear. Because you're going to hear things that have been revealed here for years. Which are the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. And that the tribulation is actually a period of time of 14 years and a short period of time of 50 days that come first. Absolutely revealed. It's not maybe. It's not kind of. It is absolute certainty. It is revealed from the beginning of creation to the end of the millennial reign. It's absolutely fantastic. And so the second video that you're going to see in here is just it's a 30 minute Bible study to introduce you to the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. Matthew, Mark, Luke, we're told the first will be last, the last will be first, becomes Luke, Mark, Matthew. And they are speaking to different groups. That's why there are differences within the same stories that in no way can they be explained away by just saying, oh, it's perspective. It's impossible. And you'll know this if you've studied Scripture, if you've studied the Synoptic Gospels. And many, many people, millions of people have had these questions over the years. Well, we reveal it here. The answer is it's prophecy. Luke is the pre-trib. Mark is the mid-trib great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. And Matthew is to the house of Judah, the return of the Lord, feet down, and then their millennial reign. It's the bride of Christ, the Gentile bride. Then it's the world, the, the, the Gentiles grafted in, the church that wasn't ready, and all those who are yet to come in the great multitude rapture in the seventh year. It's called the house of Israel that's scattered throughout the earth and is mixed in with all the Gentiles. And then, of course, the house of Judah is the end. Pre, mid, and post are all true. It's going to blow your mind. The, the third video is a 30-minute intro, again, another 30-minute one, a Bible study revealing that the end of days is not seven years long, but 14 years. And, of course, that little bit that comes first of 50 days. And the reason that people haven't understood it is, one, because it wasn't yet time, but two, because when you go to the fourth video, which is a big one, it's two hours and 45 minutes approximately, it reveals why it was never yet understood. And the bigger answer, besides it wasn't yet time, is because we've all, for hundreds of years, have been taught from the foundation of the Gospel of Matthew. And when everybody's foundation is Matthew, and they only look to Mark a little bit, and they look to Luke even less, maybe 1% or 2% of the time, to try to fill in spaces within Matthew's, they have missed who Mark and Luke are speaking to. We've got videos in this series as well that go into the discourses and show you that Luke's portion is in the above 50 days. Mark's is the seven years of seals. Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets. It is absolutely mind-blowing, and it will prove to you the 14 years and the portion called above. And within that, within that big teaching, you will see 
that because we've all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew, we've missed the understanding of why there are three synoptic Gospels. There's a reason for it. And the reason is revealed in the is to come. So you can come right here, watch the first four videos here, study them. You could email me with any questions you might have, which um, my email is in the description box under all the videos. The other thing you can do is you can go to ministryrevealed.com. We have a forum. We've got over 1,200 people around the world, like-minded brothers and sisters, seeking and searching out the, the revelation and watching and praying for the Lord, watching events in the world, uh, uh, Bible studies, questions, everything going on in there. You can join us there for free. It takes 5, 10 seconds to sign up. And um, you can find it on ministryrevealed.com. Just, again, click on the menu and go to forum. All right? So with that, brothers and sisters, I want to share something with you. You're going to see today why I knew I was being led for saving the baptism till late in the game. Okay? And I'm going to start, before we get into that, I'm going to start with something exciting that I heard today. Actually, I heard a lot of exciting things over the last couple, three days with people sharing in the forum and, and conversations I've had. It, it's been so awesome. The, it, it, guys, it's time. It is time. So you guys will remember this story, right? Um, let me show you where it was. Uh, uh, um... Oh, yeah, down here. Surrounding the mustard seed. You guys remember that video surrounding the mustard seed? Well, if you'll recall, in Luke chapter 13, we spoke about the surrounding the mustard seed, meaning the story that comes before it and then the stories that come after it, right? It was revealing this connection to a pre, mid, and post. Well, you'll remember that I spoke about this woman, right? This woman with an infirmity that she had, an infirmity of this woman for 18 years. And we connected the lift up in relation to John chapter 8, the other place where it's used, in relation to the Lord lifting himself up and he's there standing before the woman. It, it, it had a connection. Its revelation is pre-trip. It's a picture of this pre-trib bride. Well, guess what? Do you think we might have received a, a sign of something like that? Do you think maybe this ministry, the one that understands the revelation surrounding the mustard seed in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, do you think maybe out of all the ministries on the earth, the ones who have the revelation that we've been so blessed and led in by the Spirit, do you think it's possible We've been given a sign. Well, I received an email today from our sister Cindy about our brother Steve in Uganda. And our brother Steve in Uganda, who does incredible, incredible work over in Uganda. I mean, Bibles have been sent out by the thousands upon thousands in the last, oh, year and three quarters that he's been with the ministry. The Ministry Revealed book has been printed by the thousands upon thousands, well over 10,000, and to help teach and understand the people. The, 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 the timeline charts, he's printed them and he's teaching from them. He's preparing a people. You see, salvation first, then preparing the people, and he's baptizing them as well. It's not just him. He has a group of people that follow him and work with him. And that's why we do everything that we can to support them. It's not only that. They help feed the poor. They help clothe them. They help give them shoes. We also help with medicines and all of these things for them. Well, he posted in the forum the other day about this woman who was finally going to be getting surgery. Money was being raised for her here through the ministry and through the churches that he's helped establish through the ministry and over in Uganda and money was raised for her to get this surgery. Well, I didn't know the other details of it, but our sister Cindy, who's much more closely connected to getting details with Steve 
always relates it so Steve knows, and then I, I'm able to stay on top of these things as well. Well, she emailed me today to let me know that it was Steve's cousin, and her name is Hope. I don't know what ailment uh, she had, what infirmity she had, but it had to do like this. I don't know if it was a tumor or what, but she had it hanging way big below her jaw. Well, this is from, this is uh, the forum, by the way. This is her after the surgery. Well, brothers and sisters, what I found out today was there was a woman whose name is Hope, <laughs> whose name is Hope, who had an infirmity. Look, what does infirmity mean? A disease, a sickness, feeble in body. Well, do you know how long this sister Hope, Steve's cousin, had this infirmity for? 18 years. What? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was reading it from Cindy's email, and I was just like, what? So I had to get this added in to tonight's teaching to let you guys know. I think we've just been given another sign. We've just been shown a woman named Hope who was in infirmity for 18 years and just received her surgery and is now recovering after 18 years years brothers and sisters if that ain't a sign to to a word that we taught on literally just in the last month or so as as a prophetic picture as a typology of this bride man oh man <laughs> i had to share that with you it was so exciting so all right with that let's get on to the next exciting part I told you guys uh, a few videos ago because I thought it was very interesting. We have 625 teachings right now on YouTube. And some have been deleted. Some YouTube took down over the years and just over the last few months because they were talking about some things from 2020. And I don't fight them. I just, okay, whatever. Well, as you guys know, as I mentioned a few videos back, we're now at 625, and this one that I'm t teaching right now is number 626. Well, let me show you something. That means we've got this video and two more before the end comes. Look at what it means. It means to wash away. 628 means to wash away or to wash off. To have remitted, washed away, to wash fully, which is what? Baptism baptism i didn't plan that when i showed you guys that before and that's that's not the reason why i held off on doing a teaching on baptism so that everybody would get baptized if they haven't been if you haven't recently and what i mean by that is if you haven't been baptized in the name of jesus for the remission of sins to receive the gift of the holy ghost because i'm going to show you what's connected to that if you've still been holding off i know many that have since i've done the teaching Many, many people have emailed me to let me know that they did go and get baptized. I even heard of one, uh, one or two, that went to their Baptist preacher. One was, a, I think, a, a brother-in-law, and looked at them cross-eyed and wouldn't baptize them because they wanted to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins and not as Matthew 28. I told you it happens, right? It's wild. So look at where the scripture is. It's used twice. Listen to what it says. And it's the word 628, which would be the exact number of videos we will end on before the pre-trib happens on August 12th in that time frame, right, based on where you live. So in Acts 22, 16, it says, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. First, first uh, Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified. Hello, sound familiar? In the name of the Lord, by the Spirit 
of our God. You think maybe there's something going on? You think maybe the timing and the, and the number count is purposeful with everything else that's been going on in the ministry over the years? Well, what would be the next video? The next video, just as I said before, the next video, which would be in the midst of the week while the wedding's taking place, would mean if there was a video, I'm not saying there is, but what do we know happens in that week? What happens after that week? Well, it would be, my teaching, it would be number 629. What would be 629? 629 is to release, okay? Effectively, by payment, ransom. Do you think this is talking about the pre-trib? Nope. This is all about the remnant workers. And the only place it's found in the Gospels is, you guessed it, Luke 21, verse 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. This is not the redemption of the pre-trib bride of Christ. This is the redemption of the remnant priestly group that had redeemed, that had been re that, that are getting their redemption at the coming of the Lord when he returns from the wedding. Are, you're going to see this connection here tonight. And it's all about the baptism. This, this group that 628 and being baptized, having received the Spirit in the name of the Lord, that when he returns from the wedding, they will have had their redemption. They will be consecrated. They will be consecrated. It's wild. It's wild. You're going to see where all this lines up. Just like we know this is him coming on the eighth day. When he comes as the Son of Man. When he's coming on this day, what's he coming as? He's coming as light, isn't he? That's right. He's coming as light. Well, wait till you see what I got to show you on that. Something, uh, uh, I can't remember who. Somebody had shared it in the forum. And the first five minutes are going to blow you away in its connection. So when the Lord's coming for his 40 days, we know there's a group of people, right? We, we've spoken on this group many times from 1 Peter chapter 1. We see here starting in chapter four, uh, verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved for you, uh, reserved in heaven for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the end of days. That's what it means. Wherein we greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through many fold temptations. Hello that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, we know this word, right? Let's go into this word. First Peter chapter 1. At the appearing of Jesus Christ, okay? This word for appearing, we're going to see all the places it comes from, okay? It's at the appearing, at the disclosure of Christ. Is it necessarily for everybody? Well, let's see. It says, at the appearing of Christ, in whom not seen, uh, sorry, whom having not seen, you love, in whom though now you see him not, you Yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Sounds like everybody in this group, right? Receiving the end of your faith. Look at this. Even the salvation of your souls. How are you going to receive the end of your faith? You guys remember this? We've talked on it a number of times. You're going to receive the end of your faith because what? You're going to be in the presence of the Lord. Though now, trials and tribulation and dealing with things and health and everything, yet we rejoice until his appearing to this group, not just us, but this, this remnant group as a whole, 
receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. You know, we've talked about this before. We even see it in 2 Esdras, right? Where this desire, they, they, they all wanted, knowing that there was more in their prophecies that they couldn't understand, like Daniel. They, they wanted to be a part of it because they saw this, this mind-blowing visions and the words, and they, they thought, oh, my goodness. But it was, for, uh, it was for a group at the time of the end that the Lord would prepare through the revelation of his word in the leading of his spirit, searching what manner, searching, sorry, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. And then we get it again. And listen to this. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end. To the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We know what this revelation is, right? Well, look at where this revelation begins. All right? What's Luke chapter 2? Luke chapter 2 is all about the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. The Lord's coming first, but then he's also coming as what? The 40 days of the Son of Man which we know is connected to Luke chapter 2 at the birth of Christ. Something we've understood for a long time, right? In Luke chapter 2, related to the birth of Christ, which is a picture of him coming for his 40 days. But we know it's not exactly at his birth, right? We know it's not exactly at his birth. And, and who is it for? Well, we know from Isaiah chapter 9, one of my favorite verses now one of my favorite chapters knowing what we've been revealed right when the light affliction that starts in the two northern cities of israel when they're attacked when the pre-trib happens israel in the north in haifun tel aviv will be attacked and a short middle east war will take place during the wedding week in heaven during the week while a remnant group that was being prepared is still here is still here we're going to get into it, is still here. Until what? Until the Lord comes on the eighth day. See, the people walked in darkness, have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And it goes on to say, for unto us a child is born. And then it goes on to say, then the greater affliction is coming with Syria and those that are with them. That'll be at the end of 50 days, at the day and hour no one knows, Feast of Trumpets, when Syria, when the lion will have compassed them about and destroyed them. Well, we know what this is related to, right? This brings us to John chapter 8. And John chapter 8 is directly connected to what we spoke about earlier, the woman, right? And Jesus being lifted up. Right? Lifting himself up, and only the woman is there before him. And then what do we see? The 40 days of the Son of Man beginning. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. So there's light. And when the light comes, it's only the light that's coming first, right? The, the destruction of Jerusalem tribulation breaking out with nation against nation none of that starts yet it starts with the light you'll see why i'm why i'm emphasizing this in a bit it starts with the light and then once the light has passed when when the end of the 40 days and the anointing of the holy ghost comes and they go out from jerusalem as it will play out in the end of days then what comes then darkness then 
the 14 years begin at the Feast of Trumpets. The light comes and then the darkness. And what does the darkness do? Boom! It smashes everything. Does the light smash everything? Nope. Jesus is the light. Everybody's to come to the light. And then what happens when the light's gone? The darkness that comes after the light smashes everything. And how does that begin? In Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be smashed by the darkness that follows. You'll understand why I'm sharing this and as we go on a little bit further. All of this is connected in its timing, right? Just like we showed here with Isaiah chapter 9. The light affliction that comes first. And then the Son of Man is coming. Well, if you know that the Son of Man is really born in the third month, on the 15th day of the third month, you would say, well, hey, it's already passed. This must have really been Shavuot and the time has passed. But that's not the case. We've taught on these things. We know that this is actually the beginning of the winter wheat harvest. This is Taurus. This is the beginning of the seven Sabbaths. That start right here. That's the start of your week. One, two, seven Sabbaths ends on the 8th of Av, August 12th, as we've been teaching for a year, pointing to this date for a year now. We've understood it. We know that's the time. But how do you get then the Lord returning from the wedding at the time of his birth about two months later? You guys all know this, right? Because we find out that Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born, after the affliction, after the light affliction, we find out that Jesus in from the was into the is fulfilled it in Matthew chapter 4. But did he fulfill it at his birth? Nope. He never fulfilled it at his birth. We, it, it would seem to imply in Isaiah 9 that it was connected to his birth. And remember, when John baptized Jesus in Luke chapter 3, it said Jesus began to be 30. He began to be about 30 years of age. So it was right around his 30th birthday. Right? Or I would say even 29 and it was the day after because he would be in his 30th year. But the point is, it was right around his birthday. Well, you would think then it would be connected to that, his birthday. But listen to when Jesus fulfilled this. It says, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed to Galilee and he fulfilled by going through Zebulun and Naphtalim. That it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Those that sat in darkness saw a great light. Jesus fulfilled the was in the is, and there's still a prophetic is to come. But we knew for years that there was a, the sun was off by two months. We didn't know how to account for it. We knew there was something, but it took us forever. But we knew it was important because that was confirmed by the Holy Ghost. And what did we find out a year ago? It wasn't until after John was cast into prison, which means it did not take place at the birth of Jesus, but it was about two months later. Remember, Jesus was baptized, went into the wilderness, came back, had the disciples, those guys following him, and John was still baptizing in the other place. It was about two months later, which is why when you go from the birth of Christ in here <clears throat> and you count seven Sabbaths and then you have the week wedding, then you have the return of the Lord on the eighth day, which is what? Two months after his birth, directly in line to the true Feast of Weeks which is the 8th of Av every single year, which is the end of the 7th Sabbath from the beginning of the sickle being put to the wheat. The true Feast of Weeks, 7 Sabbaths. It is winter wheat, the first wheat of the year that starts to get cut at the very end of May into early middish June. This year, it was middish. It was around the 21st of June, give or take. And we even showed a video of it happening on in, in somewhere in America. And they weren't the only ones. This was so powerful to understand this revelation and that it began from when he was cast into prison. 
All of this is connected to the Lord coming as a light to lighten who first? The Gentiles. The Gentile age will go to the end of seals. It'll go to that seventh year of seals where the great multitude will come in to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Because the Gentiles are grafted in. This period of time is also spoken about to who? Listen to what it says. Romans chapter 8. And remember, this is all about the G602. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Well, we know that one quite well too, don't we? Who, who is this group? It's, it's the remnant group, right? Everybody going pre-trib is in Christ. But not only in Christ, they are also spirit-filled. They are being led by the spirit, in the spirit, in Christ Jesus. Not being led by the flesh. And what do we know about them? Well, I'm going to share it even though I've shared it before because this is all about that remnant group. And you're going to see how it leads into what's going to continue to come here. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Who are the ones led by the Spirit of God? Just like, like our brother Mark likes to say, you know, the one oneers In the beginning, this is Christ. In the beginning, the word beginning is Jesus, the feast of first fruits. In the beginning, God the Father created. So in Christ, God created everything in Christ. Exactly like the New Testament tells. I think uh, uh, in uh, um, Colossians. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God. There it is. Son, Father, Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. As we've shared many times, this is what the, what the world has called gap theory. They don't know how long this was. We revealed it. It's another set of seven days or 7,000 years. But they flew by so quickly, he was so excited to create that it seemed unto him like days. And it relates to the 50 days that are the above 14 years. We've got a teaching on it. If you watch that intro series, by the time you get down to the end, you'll see the video called It's All a Fractal. Please don't start there. Your mind won't be able to handle it unless you have understood what has been revealed and you, you pray over it. You seek it and search it. Study it. And then look what comes next. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. What was this light? Of course, we know that is Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God is everybody going pre-trib. It's everybody going pre-trib and the remnant from among them. The remnant from among them who are going to what? Suffer for Christ. They're going to be his witnesses. Right? The, the John the Baptist that represent the Moses and the Elijahs. I don't know. I, I've said it before. I'm not so sure who the, the Moses portion is. After talking with our brother Roy today, uh, you know, we might be a bit on a trail of it, but that's going to be left aside because I can't prove it. I don't know with certainty in the time of the end when the Lord makes himself known to, to the remnant, then we'll know. I believe we are the Elijah company being prepared. We are the Smyrna being prepared. Listen to what it says next. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. You guys all know the teachings that in, in uh, Laodicea, those who, when he returns and knocks, that's the beginning. That's right at the tail end, right before the pre-trip. And then when the seven churches play out again, as we've shown in the teachings, when they play out again and it comes to the very end of Laodicea again, then what happens? We know it's the resurrection of the just 
these guys are resurrected who put their necks on the line. And what are they going to do? They're going to be joint heirs with Christ. They're going to be sitting in his throne with him as he sits in his father's with his. Wild stuff. And you're going to see how this elaborates as we get further into tonight's teaching. And joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. You guys know those teachings, you know, suffering with them, right? He's the stone. He's the rock. We are stones. He is the big lamb. We are the little lambs. He is the greater light. We are the little light. That's the remnant that are going to serve him. That we may be also glorified together. Glorified what? Together having suffered with him as he suffered. To bring in his people. The house of Israel. The world. Those, the, those that have lost their light. That need the light shined on them. Which is the great multitude rapture that's coming in. Hence they will take part in being glorified together with them. Hence their resurrection in Revelation chapter 20. Reigning and ruling with them as priests. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time, uh, of this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature, the creature is related to Mark's group. It's the second creation from the light in the days of creation. The creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. This is, you know what this tells you, right? This, this, this rem, the, the, the great multitude, the, the, the house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in, in the time of the end, in the is to come picture. They're waiting, not because they know it, but the spirit in them is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. What is this manifestation of the sons of God? It's the pre-trib taken and the remnant workers that are going to remain to serve. You see, these guys got corrupted. They were corrupted by Lucifer and those that fall, fell with Lucifer. They were corrupted. They were the creation in light. And these are the ones that need to be rescued. Because they don't have the rest of their lives. They only have the rest of seals. For the creature was made subject unto was made subject to vanity. You see, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. Why were they subjected to vanity? Well, go look up the image. Go look up uh, the corruption that happened in the days of creation. It was to these this creation of beings that were in light. It's wild, wild stuff. Okay. Um, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It's so awesome. So, so awesome. So what are we seeing? We know that there's going to be a suffering. We know that there's going to be joint heirs for this remnant group, this group that is going to have the light shining on them, right? We saw it right here. Let's go see. What was it in... Uh, in Romans 8, 19, that's where I almost was. Oh, yeah, that's where it was right here. Okay? For the earnest expectation and the manifestation of the sons of God. Look at that word. There's your 602. The manifestation of the sons of God. What, what is this manifestation of the sons of God? This is all about the remnant workers. It is connected to the pre-trib, but it is also connected to those who are chosen to remain. Remember Romans 16? This is such an awesome one. We taught on Romans, you know, the last chapter of Romans, the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, the last chapter of 2 Corinthians. It's all about a pre-trib uh, pre worker group, the mid-trib worker group, which is uh, uh, the 144 will go out during trumpets, and then the post in uh, 2 Corinthians. It says, now the third time I am coming to you. It's so awesome. And we've shown how Priscilla and Aquila, they're the ones who put their own necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. They're the first fruits of Achia unto Christ. This is that remnant group. We, we used to teach on them a lot. We know them well now. And 
Listen to what it says at the end. It says in Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of the power to establish you according to my gospel and according to the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation, 602, of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Sound familiar? Weren't the, the creatures waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God? This is telling you the pre-trib, when it has happened, the revelation of the mystery, which is kept secret since the beginning of the world, has happened. You see, that's why most people have missed the truth in the revelation of the pre-trib. Most people will go to Revelation chapter 7 and say that that's the pre-trib. Most of them go to Matthew and try to explain the pre-trib happening in Matthew. They can't do it. Because that mid-trib in Revelation chapter 7, some will, some will call it just mid-trib. Others will call it pre-trib. At least the mid-trib are right. They're just not right on the number of years. And that's where people go. Because there's really nowhere else where it's clearly stated because the pre-trib is the mystery. It's the one that was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest. And people have told me in the past, oh, this is about Jesus when he came the first time. I know. It's the revelation. It's the layer of the prophetic is to come revealed within it. And once you see it through the revelation of the gospels of the pre, mid, and post, and who's going first and second and third, a taking, a taking, and a return, it all starts to open up to you. See, so, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations. See, the whole world is going to be now made aware of it when the pre-trip happens. And who were those that got to go? For the obedience of faith. For the obedience of faith. But what does it start with? The revelation. At the revelation of Christ Jesus. Everything relating to this is pre-trib and to Christ. Look at Galatians 1.12. For neither, uh, sorry, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Kind of sounds familiar, right? How about Ephesians 1.17? That the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and and revelation in the knowledge of him. Sounds familiar as to what's been happening, right? How about Ephesians 3.3? 3, 3? How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. This is crazy, right? It's all connected to the pre-trib and the remnant from among them. We know this appearing, right? We've spoken about this. We just shared it in 1 Peter 1, 7, and 13. At the revealing of Christ Jesus? How about 1 Peter 4.13? But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Wait a second, didn't we just see that? Isn't there a group that would suffer with him? Suffer as he suffered to be glorified with him and be joint heirs? Does that mean people in our current day and age until before the pre-trib? Yes. But it's also prophetically speaking about a remnant who will be resurrected, glorified with him. That will sit on his throne with him as well. But rejoice in as much, uh, in as, much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. You see, you got to be ready. We have to be prepared to endure these things. That when his glory shall be revealed you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Just as it told us earlier in 1 Peter 1, which of course then takes us to, well, let's go to Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, where we tied this all into in the past when we taught on this. Is it the appearing to the Lord? Well, let's see. The revelation, there it is. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him 
to show unto his servants. Is everybody his servant? Everybody has a different part. All right? The servants are going to go out and serve the body. The body is the church. Where is the church during tribulation? They're on the earth. They're during seals. His body is gone. His bride is gone. But there's still there's still the, the church portion, right? So to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Isn't that what's been happening? All related. So we know when the Lord, re when he reveals himself, that is when he's going to reveal himself to his servants, whom then he's going to have a meal with, right? They're the ones who will put their necks on the line. They're going to be part of the resurrection of the just at the end who will sit in his throne with them. And who are they? They are the priests. They are the anointed priestly line of the end of days. We've showed this, remember, in Luke chapter 12. Just like we saw a moment ago. It says in Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Here it is again. Let your loins be girded about. Let your loins be girded about. Where did we just see that? Roman, was it Romans 8? Uh, where was it? Where was it? Where was it? Oh, I think it was, oh, 1 Peter. All right? So here it is. This same group. Wherefore, gird your loins. Okay? Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end of the grace which is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where does the revelation of Jesus Christ begin? It begins in Luke chapter 12. It begins when he tells the remnant group, when the pre-trib, just before the pre-trib happens, he's letting them know, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. You see, they're, they're going to remain. The wedding is a week long and they're going to remain here. They're going to remain in their homes. But you could also say they're going to remain what? In their temple, right? Because all during seals, the temple of God is still within. It's not until trumpets time that the physical temple is built. So during the seven years of seals, during the Gentile age, it's still the temple that is within. So when they're to remain, when he returns and comes knocking, that they may open unto him immediately. Is it a physical thing like the Lord's going to knock on everybody's door? I don't think so, but I think we'll all be ready for it, right? It's going to be knocking most likely on our hearts, on our spirit. And we, we, would, we would see him or, or his angel, whatever it's going to be, that we would be ready. And we know that it says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself. Then he will gird himself. And make them to sit down to eat and will come forth and serve them. This is that first watch. This is that group that we're talking about. And he's letting them know these things before the pre-trib. Moments before. I don't know exactly how long. But moments before the pre-trib. He's going to let his remnant know. So that they're not freaking out wondering why they've been left behind. We've shared on this many times. And you're going to see today that they're left behind, purposely left. Okay? And they will know it. They will be ready. They will be watching, waiting for that knock when he comes, either on their temple, which is within them, or, you know, maybe also metaphorically, you know, this knock on the door of their houses as well. Okay? Well, when Jesus comes, when he returns from the wedding, which is a seven day wedding, we know it's directly connected to this, right? 
John chapter 8, as we covered just a little while ago. John chapter 8, we see the woman taken in adultery. Nobody could stone her except him who is without sin. Let him cast the first stone at her. We've taught for a long time that this stone is the stone. It is Christ. When, when he is returning for the, uh, uh, after the wedding, when he's returning on the eighth day, this is him casting the stone. And then look what he tells her. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Whether you want to say it's connected to the pre-trib, because remember, it's always a combination. There's the pre-trib and there's the remnant from among them. So there is the, the, the bride that he's standing before and then there's the remnant bride that he returns for who are going to serve him. And you have this go and sin no more. And then what do we have? Here he is. So we've got this stone's throw. When do we know the stone's throw is coming? It's coming during the week, during the wedding week. And we see this in Luke chapter 21, of course, when men's hearts will fail them for fear of looking after these things that are coming upon the earth. That's why it was directly connected to what we saw in Luke chapter 21 when the redemption, come on, when the redemption draws nigh, right? To look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. This is the Son of Man coming in a cloud as the white horse rider on the eighth day after the seven-day wedding. He is coming to his remnant workers, and this is the craziness that's coming as he's, as he's returning. It is the stone's throw. We see it there in John 8, just before he is the, the light in the darkness. He is that light that is coming. And what's following him when he leaves, when the light's gone, is the darkness. It is the darkness when the red horse rider comes, and what do we know happens from it? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Peace is taken from the earth, and a great sword is given. The darkness will follow after. You're going to see what I mean in this. But it's all connected to this pre-trib, to this, to this remnant bride portion. This group that's going to be, be baptized, having been baptized in the water, being ready. And then we'll go through the trials of fire. You see, this trials of fire that's coming. When the Lord is here for 40 days, we know it's going to be right off the bat in the 40 days. Remember that in Luke chapter 21? We know that when it says, right? Then said he unto them, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's the red horse rider, right? Great earthquakes, all these things. But what does he say in verse 12? But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends. And some of you they shall cause... To be put to death. This is all in the 40 days. They've had the meal with the Lord. He opens their understanding. And this is their trial by fire that begins. They need to be purified. They need to be purified as you're going to see to receive what? The Ruach, the Holy Ghost. To receive the Holy Ghost. They're needing this purification of fire. This trial that's about to come against them. In the midst of these 40 days. Some will die. But not all of them. We know this. This is the same group from uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2. With Smyrna. It's the Luke 24 group. The remnant priestly line. Those that will be his witnesses. There's a trial by fire in these 40 days to purify for the Holy Ghost. 
Remember when we talk about the Holy Ghost, we talked about it many times. We call it Acts 2.0. That when this anointing of the Holy Ghost happens on the 29th of Elul, when this happens, do you think anybody gets this Holy Ghost anointing? It's for the priests. It's access to the throne. You know, you're going to see as we go into a video a little bit further, the second video I'm going to get into is, is you're going to see like people have often wondered over the centuries, how come we don't have this healing power? How come we don't have this access? How come we don't have this prophetic words in, in this truth of this clarity like they did in the past? Well, because it's far removed. We've been going through the ages of the churches. But it's coming again. And it'll be beyond measure from what they had the first time in Acts chapter 2. But a people must be cleansed and put through the fire to receive that anointing of the Holy Ghost. That's what's coming. That's what's coming. This is what is going to be what this remnant group is going to go through. <coughs> it's going to begin right off the bat. But it won't begin until after that meal with the Lord where he opens their understanding. Just like we saw in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, when he said that, is the exact same thing as we taught in one of the recent videos when he returns from the wedding feast, he's going to have that banquet. And this banquet that he has will be with that group who remains, who are going to be those who are part in the resurrection of the just. The, the Priscilla's and Aquila's, the Smyrna's, the two on the road to Emmaus that represent the, the, the John the Baptist as the Elijah Moses, Moses's. That's what's coming. But there's going to be a fire. There's going to be a testing during those 40 days. But there also needed to be a cleansing. These 40 days, uh, these seven days, are we've showed them everywhere. It's the same like the, the seven days in the story of Noah. Right? Where it says, for yet 70 days. Uh, sorry, for yet seven days. And then it says, and it came to pass after seven days. What happened after seven days? It means on the eighth day, then the 40 days began. Same thing. The, the seven to the eighth day. After seven is the eighth day. We've seen it everywhere, everywhere, repeating, repeating, repeating. And we've seen it also in Luke chapter 9. And wait until you see why I led you all the way to this. For this first video we're going to show tonight. We know who this group is, right? This is the pre-trib group right here. Connected to this. But I tell you the truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Next thing they see, boom, is the kingdom of God. The pre-trib is not going to have something so clearly obvious to the world and to those, even though they're ready in Christ, I believe the pre-trib will be 144 million people. I've explained it a long time ago in the past. I believe that's the answer. It, it doesn't mean it's going to be absolutely correct. It's just what I have discerned, which will only be about 1.8% of the population of the world, which will equal about 10% of the church. It's wild when you understand it. 1.8% of the world being vanished pre-trib will equal 10% of the church, which is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And then what do we see? And it came to pass about an eight days after these things. So we know it means years and days here, which means it's almost the eighth year. So in a 21-year picture, it's almost the next set of seven about to start, which is the 14 years. But it's also telling us the eighth day that the Lord is coming for this as the Son of Man to begin his 40 days. 
And it says, it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. Get ready. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. Glistering white. Isn't that funny? This word is only used once. Oftentimes, when a, when a word is used once, it can be very difficult to understand its meaning. But in, in relation to the transfiguration in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, we've seen that with certain words. And we can understand it because we know this is a typology in the prophetic of the Lord coming to begin his 40 days. In Mark, we've seen it. It relates to the end of the six years of seals when he's coming with Mount Zion, when heavenly Mount Zion is coming down. And then we see it in Matthew as the end of six years of trumpets, in the end of the sixth year, when he's returning feet down at that 14th year, the last year of tribulation, which is the seventh year of trumpets, when he's returning feet down as lightning. We've explained all these so we can show sometimes why there's this one word being used in all of Scripture right here. And then in Mark, and then in Matthew. Well, this one's even heavier. Because if this is the Lord returning to begin his 40 days after the wedding, as we've been showing through all of this, as we've shared many times, we are preparing the remnant bride, brothers and sisters. We are preparing that, that Elijah company, that, that one line as, as, as John the Baptist. There's still that Moses line out there as well. But they are all a priestly line for the end of days. And I want you to understand this word glistening. To shine forth, to be radiant. We know that it is the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days. When? Like everything I've been leading you up to in this. It's when he comes on the eighth day. Whoops. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Uh, no. What am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? John. It's related to when he comes on the eighth day to the sons of God when he's going to come as light and shine his light in the darkness. It's the same as Isaiah, as I was telling you, which was revealed in Matthew to show us that it was two months later, which shows us it's the 15th to the 16th of the month of Av, when he returns from the wedding, he is that light, that, that stone, that people are going to be freaking out. He's coming as light. Check this out. Check this out. We're going to watch the first five minutes. This brother here, I watched him years ago, and it's some pretty wild stuff, but I haven't watched him in a long time. This was shared in the forum, and many of you guys, we've talked about the Shroud of Turin as well. It is absolutely the true uh, uh, Shroud of Christ. We've proven it through Scripture, through the, the pendant that he was wearing that's around his neck. You see this little line right here? They showed the letters on it, which revealed Taurus exactly what we knew. We knew it revealed Taurus, and nobody seems to have understood it yet. Well... He relates it here to the Shroud of Turin. But wait till what you wait till you understand what he says about the light of it. Okay, my friends, you might say this is everything coming. I don't want to go too fast for you guys. I'm going to go on a little bit of speed. I don't want it to take too long. And then the next one, too, I'm going to keep it on a little bit of speed when we get to the next teaching, the next video, because we got some things to cover in it. But uh, you could always... Slow down me if you're listening to me on faster speed, and then uh, you can always speed it up later. All right? Bring together in a flash. Well, I claim a flash. Of course. Also. Swift destruction. We don't need a car right now. Created this image. And what was the flash? The flash was light. Light is what we want to ascend back to. Light has no weight whatsoever. None. Zero. 
white light is the brilliant light, basically electricity. It's the light, the bright light that you fill your batteries with. You don't, you gain no weight whatsoever when you fill a battery. No weight. But a, lot, a ton of electricity and charge and energy. And that's exactly what caused this. And this 1823 blew my mind. All right, now don't forget, this goes back many, many, many years to like 1970. I said everything is made of atomic vapor. That means everything literally is made out of light, which is the black and white particles. And I have been saying right along now that 1,823 dipoles make up a proton. When the proton explodes, which a proton is basically what hydrogen is. When hydrogen explodes, it gives off just brilliant radiant white light. Well, what's, that? what's the cause of that? The cause is the white particles going out and then the black particles following them. The only thing that has any weight whatsoever is the black particles. The white particles have no weight whatsoever. All they do is singe things, and that's precisely what happened. And 1823 means brilliant white light singeing a garment. Okay, so my number is 1823, and so what, Roger? What does the number mean? Well, I had no idea it meant anything other than the number of dipoles that are in a proton. So in other words, a proton is not one big ball like that. It's 1823 dipoles. And when that explodes, it turns into complete, total, unbelievable light, and then the dark part follows it. So first of all comes the light, then the dark. And that's what happened with Jesus' body. All the light came out first, singed the cloth, and then the dark went on its way. I need help with this, my friends. I got this this morning after doing the video about <laughs> what I thought caused the impression on the, or the um, likeness on the Shroud of Turin. And this came from Mike Barber, and he said, Roger, look at Strong's 1823. It means a gleam of flashing light. And I said, wow, that's interesting. So I said, I'll do a fit on it, which I am doing right now. All right, this is a, a, a number system ascribed to basically every word in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and, and they put a number ascribed to it. And 1823 is particularly interesting to me. All right, this is why this is so interesting. My claim is that this is what's called a dipole electron, all right? They call it a gluon. It has a positive and a negative side to it. The positive never changes. It's dark matter. It's, it, it's, it doesn't do anything other than have mass. The white part has all the energy. And when they split apart, the white has just a brilliant amount of energy. Oh, and I'm energy. sure it has a ton. Well, I know it has a ton of heat. It will just vaporize anything that it hits, just like the shroud. The black just goes on and bounces and moves things away, but it doesn't burn anything. It, it just pushes things. Now, this is what the proton looks like, and this is why it's so important to me. This is the two particles that make up everything there is. There's nothing that isn't made of these two particles. It, it looks to me like we want to become that particle and ascend and become the brilliant <laughs> white light. It's everywhere in the ancient text it says you want to ascend into the light and leave the dark behind. The dark is your material weight. This has no weight whatsoever, none, zero. All the weight you have is in the dark matter of your body. You want to leave that behind. <laughs> <clears throat> so that was very telling. And now, what is he talking about? He's talking about the 1,823 dipoles that make this the these protons, okay? Everything is made of these things, and it's, it, it's the white and black. The white goes out, and it sheds the light, and it shines the light everywhere. And then what follows, like in an explosion, it's, it's the light, and the light goes flying through and then what follows then the black comes and it's the black that brings about like he said pushes everything that's what actually destroys everything well brothers and sisters let me show you this this number here it is right here right to lighten to oh glistering glistering i, I think we saw that just a moment ago right how about luke 929 do we know of, of the Lord who is coming as we just saw in Luke chapter 9? Which is directly related to when he said he would come as light. We have revealed here 
that the Son of Man, as the white horse rider, is coming to shed his light, to shine his light when he comes for the 40 days. For all those who in darkness, he is shedding his light. We saw it from Isaiah. That from Isaiah, there's the light affliction, and he's going to come to those who are in the darkness and shine his light. We saw it in, in chapter uh, um, John chapter 8. We know that when he comes to begin his 40 days, he is coming to shine his light. And when he comes to shine his light, he's coming first to the remnant. And to the remnant, he's going to shine his light because what are they going to do? They need his light. Oh, sure, we are flesh, we are spirit, and we have the light of the Lord. But did you hear what I was saying earlier? We don't have the power that the ancient ones, you know, 2,000 years ago had in the spirit. <clears throat> well, do you think we have the power of the light within us to the same uh, uh, strength that these guys had in the past? No. So when the Lord comes, when he comes to begin his 40 days, and there's a remnant group who he's prepared, who have been watching and praying, and he's led in the revelation of his word to prepare them who have been water baptized, who have been cleansed inside to clean the out as well. <clears throat> well, when he comes, what does he have to do? He's got to give us his light. He has to give us his light so that we have the ability to shine his light throughout the time of seals because this second group of creation those who are the world, the, the Gentiles, the, the church, the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in. They're his group from the light creation. As we've taught many times, as we've shown in the, in the uh, uh, fractal video and more. He's coming to shed his light in the, shine his light in the darkness. And the first group he's coming to shine it to is the remnant. And the word for that white, for the number of dipoles that represent the white that goes out first before the black follows and destroys everything is used one time in Scripture. Do you understand what I'm sharing? The one place it's used in Scripture is the one place, or one of the many, but the one place where it's used is the exact place we've been teaching for years of the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days when he starts by shining his light. Isn't that crazy? Man, that just blows my mind. So when you go to Luke chapter 21, and we see him coming here, and we know that there's a stone's throw, and we're seeing all of this perplexity and all this chaos that's coming. What do you think's causing it? This light and, and this fragment of things that have broken up or whatever it might look like in relation to the stone's throw? The light that's coming? That light that's coming maybe is a stone? That breaks up? It is wild, guys. It is wild. I could not believe when he showed that it was used one time and we found out when it was posted in the forum, this is the one place it's used. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Talk about confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. Brothers and sisters, every time, as you guys know, every time this happens, every time something is shared with this wild connection, it always 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 fits in the place where it's supposed to be in revelate in the, in the revelation of prophecy in the 50 days and 14 years that are coming this is just another absolutely incredible example absolutely incredible because it's when he's coming as light so wild so so wild <clears throat> all right now this is again we're going back into this this preparation that we've talked about this preparation 
And not only was I leading you into this portion of light and understanding it, but this this remnant group, this group that is told beforehand, right before the pre-trib happens, to be ready when he returns from the wedding. That when he comes, now you could see this light that's coming, that's going to be put upon them so that they can go out and shed that light. But we also know that they are a priestly group that are going to have to wait for seven days. Are they going to wait in heaven? Are they going to wait here? You're going to see they're going to wait here and they're going to wait remaining within the temple, which means still within their body. And what are they going to do? Well, they're going to have to be tested by fire, right? There's, there's going to be a testing that's coming. Well, we know this testing that happens for them in the midst of the 40 days, as we just taught in, in Luke 21. This 40 days, this testing is coming upon them because they're the ones that are going to be anointed to serve the Lord as his priest. You know what else you're going to see? You're going to see that they're going to be a priest forever. They're going to be a priestly line forever. Forever. And what do you think they're going to have to do? Do you think maybe their job is to bring in Israel? To bring in the body? Well, hold on tight. Let's have a listen to this one. Um, oh, I've got this one on really fast, too. I'm going to probably, I'm going to try this at 1.5, okay? I don't want it to take too long, but hopefully it's not too fast. Again, you can just slow it down if you're listening to me on, on whatever speed you're listening to me on. You could always slow it down uh, if you've sped it up. All right, here we go. Let's recap what well, we covered in part four. Uh, it was one that I knew would probably jostle some people. Because okay, let me, he still speaks at pretty good speed too, so. I'll go to 1.25, just like the last one. Because, you know, I did make a couple of bold claims, so to speak. We saw that following baptism of water comes baptism of fire, and not in the... Because I'm interrupting, I'm going to bring it back right there. Actually, I'm going to bring it back to the beginning. Um, I want to make a... Just say about this guy, too. I can't remember his name. Somebody let me know what his name was before, and I can't recall. He has some fantastic teachings. As you're going to see here as we break some of this down tonight, I know he only understands seven years. I know he only sees the 144,000. But I'm going to bring clarity to some of these things that he's talking about, and you're going to see this direct connection to this, this power and purpose of the baptism for this priestly line. You're going to see it. So if you haven't been baptized yet, now you're going to want to get baptized. You might want to watch the last video that's, that's got dismal views for the four days already. Because people just think, oh, baptism, whatever. No. You're going to understand. And I have understood. I, this is what I was telling you at the beginning. I have understood why I was being led by the Spirit to wait till we were very close to the end before making another video on the water baptism. This is the answer. And you're going to see it in the preparation of the priestly line. And this brother has some incredible teachings. We've, I've shown a couple of his along the way over the last couple of years. He has some great teachings. But always understand, his perspective doesn't understand the mystery. Okay, He might be a pre-trib, but he doesn't understand the mystery of the pre-trib. He doesn't understand the mystery of the priestly line because he always relates it to the 144. But understand, it's pre-144. It is this first remnant bride group. And even though he might know it's a remnant bride group, he still associates it to 144. You see, if he had what we knew and him and I were working together, man, it would be explosive. He can do a teaching. I could relate it and put it into the 14 and 50 days first. It would be explosive. And that's why I go into some of his teachings like this sometimes and break them down because we can directly relate it to the things that we're talking about and bring about more clarity to these things that we've shared. So let's have a listen. Um, let's recap what we covered in part four. Uh, it was one that I knew would probably jostle some people because, you know, I did make a couple of bold claims, so to speak. 
We saw that following baptism of water comes baptism of fire, and not in the charismatic sense, that fire is actually refining, the fire of refining, the fire of purification, the being put into the smelting pot, as it were. We need to go through that fire so that hopefully we can actually be trusted with the fullness of his Ruach. And this was the bold statement that I made last week, that we, don't, uh, that we weren't baptised in the Ruach. And uh, I really have, I hope this came across strongly last week, but... So you see it right there. This is what I was talking about earlier, right? There, there is this priestly line. There is a priestly line being prepared. We are baptised. We have the Spirit, but there's this fire. There's this fire that's coming. We saw, even from Luke 21, right? This, this fire, this, this trial that, that the workers are going to go through during the 40 days before the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We see this even in um, Luke chapter 12. I think it's 12. In Luke chapter 12, when he forewarns them, as we saw earlier about being girded about, and you come down further here, he talks about bringing division. And listen to what he says. This is in relation to his coming for 40 days. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. He's got a baptism by fire. And so do his remnant group that are with him. There's a baptism by fire coming. And how do we know it relates to the end? Because he's bringing division. He's bringing division within households. Why is he bringing division? Because it's the end of the age. <coughs> it's the time of seals. And then who are the ones that are going to bring them back from this division? It's the Elijahs. The John the Baptist Elijahs who are working during seals. This is how you know it's directly another prophetic type related to the end of days. We saw it in Malachi, in chapter 4 and, and, and elsewhere in Malachi. The, the, the type of the Elijah that hadn't yet occurred. That's why we see it in Mark's transfiguration. We don't see it in Luke's transfiguration. Because he hasn't brought back father and son and reunited everybody till the end of seals. When the Lord comes for 40 days, he's bringing fire. He's bringing fire. It's this purification process. And it's coming for the remnant workers. That light that's singeing first. It's wild. Again, I knew I would get some knee jerks on this, and I did. Um, just to really clarify, I'm not saying we're void of the Ruach. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, we're all here because of the Ruach. You know, I'm not going to deny the operating of the Spirit in our lives. That would be folly. But all I'm saying is that we didn't have it, or we don't have it, to the fullness of definitely the apostles. So I'm not saying that you're void of it. I'm just saying we don't have the fullness of it. Why? I believe is because we need to be refined first so that we can be trusted with it. To really make the point clear, you've got to realize that this. To have that fullness of the Spirit, you have the power of the throne, essentially. And again, you don't give such a powerful tool to someone that doesn't know how to wield it responsibly. Um, I hope that came across last week. I think it did, but again, it's one of them statements um, that triggers people, if you want to say that. And it did, if, like, I got emails last week, guys, just to let you know, uh, several of them. <laughs> so this is why I'm really trying to make this point clear. I'm not saying you don't have the spirit. I'm just saying we're not walking in the fullness of it. And I think that's a fair statement to say. It does not demean um, Paul's words, you know, that the spirit is a pledge that has been given to us. It's that seal to show, that, that, to give us hope that we have been bought with a price. I'm not taking that away. Anyway, <laughs> The baptism of, of fire is actually required due to the state that the house of Israel is in, and that's a state of spiritual adultery. That's why we need it, especially as we draw closer to the end of the age, now more than ever. We, we're two, almost 2,000 years removed from the days that Yeshua walked the earth, which means there's 2,000 years worth of monkey business that we've inherited. And here's the thing, that we're already in a pretty bad state in the days of Yeshua which is why he called him out on certain things. How much more we, therefore how much more do we need the fire in our lives? 
The problem is actually twofold. The teachers and the audience are the problem. We saw this uh, in the prophets. It says because false prophets, false teachers have gone out and they're basically spreading falsehood in the name of Yah. But then we also know that the audience are the ones that want to pile upon themselves teachers to itch the ears. So the problem is twofold. And then you get this lovely vicious cycle. It's see, again, something we've talked about. <clears throat> when... When there's all of these people giving words on YouTube and, and visions or dreams and, and teachers saying that, you know, all sorts of different things. I, do I think that they're all being false teachers? No. Are there many that are false? Absolutely. But we're living in a time of trying to discern which ones are false, which ones aren't. There's a whole bunch saying it's going to be like this and a whole bunch saying it's going to be like that. Nobody's able to discern which way it's supposed to go. You see? We, it's, it's this, it, there's a preparation that is happening. Why, why wouldn't everybody come or want to listen to the revelations that we share with them? Why wouldn't they watch a 30-minute video on the differences in the Gospels when they've all known, if they've studied the Scriptures, they've all known there were these differences that, that couldn't be fully accounted for. And we could show it to them, and all they have to do is begin with a 30-minute video. Yet they don't want to do it. Yet they're watching prophecy. Yet they're, they're teaching on prophecy. They're doing all these things. Is it because they're itching ears? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this connection to what's going on and this baptism and this fire is that there's a group, as he talks about, there, there's a portion being prepared, being, being taught and revealed his word to prepare them for the time to come that are going to be refined in this fire of Luke 21 that are going to be refined in this time while he's here and being rejected for 40 days. Some of them are going to die for it. And then the others will be what? They will be ready to receive the fullness of the Holy Ghost at the anointing of the Holy Ghost of what we call Acts 2.0. There's a preparation happening. It's our hearts that are being refined, not our flesh. And that's something that people tend, it's, they put the horse before the cart on this one. If you're, as Yeshua says, clean the inside of the cup, the outside shall then be clean. Let's not focus on the flesh. If you want to clean up your flesh, clean your heart up. The outcome of that is that you'll start to walk in a more pleasing way. Heart circumcision does not necessarily need adversity to refine it. People always assume that they need calamity or something like that to refine their hearts. Yeah, it works very well. But I believe you can have that heart circumcision without calamity. If you need <laughs> like he said, you know, it works very well when there is adversity, right? When there is this calamity in our lives. I can attest to it. You guys know my story. I can attest to it. Uh, one of our brothers that I was speaking to just recently, his story can attest to it. There, there seems to be... Uh, I won't say a need, right? He's saying, you know, it can happen without a calamity. But this calamity, just like the fire that's coming for that remnant group, what's the, what would be the purpose of the fire in this 40 days in the is to come if there wasn't a purpose for this calamity? It's this refining. It's this refining so that you cry out to him. And he says, you know, is, is it really necessary? Uh, maybe it's not necessary. But for those that are brought to the edge, that have endured something, and the Lord has brought them back, they are forever eternally grateful and thankful. They know what the Lord has done in their lives. So there's something to be said about that. But I do agree with them that it's not necessarily necessary. But I can attest, and I know many others, where that is what did it for them. I would I would most likely still be a sleeping church. Right? If I kept doing what I was doing, geez, I'm, I might even have walked away and been dead. But the Lord pulled me out of that calamity. And knowing it and realizing it, you just, you're on fire. You won't turn from them. You know what you know. Need calamity in your life, that should be pause for thought and concern. The fact that it would take calamity to really bring something out is it's indicative of the state that we're in, actually, and truly how um, devious our flesh can be. 
And I make the point of, look, we're in the lead up to unleavened bread right now. I know that there's a work being done in, the, in my spirit and my situation is actually pretty good, but I know something is being done. So praise the Father that for some reason, calamity is not being needed this year. We are not walking at the level of the first century assembly, point blank. And the problem that we, I believe, not until Acts 2.0 believe we see today is we read the scriptures especially things like the book of acts and the pauline letters and we go well why are we not seeing these things and generally it either leads to self-condemnation or it leads to delusion we we rebrand or we manufacture what the gifts of the spirit are so that we can then delude ourselves and say well look at what we're doing we've got what is written in the book and i'm making the claim no we're not so what's the healthy thing that we need to do? We can't fall in self-condemnation and we won't delude ourselves. So really we need to humble ourselves and ask, why are we not being trusted with the, with the power of the throne? We need to be refined. And in fact, the prophecies are very clear on this. This is why we need a great tribulation to refine us. The fullness of the Ruach really underscore the fullness. Again, I'm not saying we're void of it, but we're definitely not walking in the fullness of it. However, it is prophesied that the fullness of that Ruach will be poured upon the house of Israel. But whenever you look at this, generally it's tied to the regathering, which means that this is tied to the resurrection. Um, however, I did say that in the lead up to the end of the age, I believe we're clearly going to start seeing these things again. You exactly what we've been talking about, right? The Acts 2.0 will be that fullness of the Holy Ghost on that remnant group, as well as the apostles that will have received it first. And... Then you have what? Then you have upon Israel as a whole and in relation to the regathering or resurrection. The only thing is, this regathering resurrection isn't all of Israel. It's the remnant. It's the remnant who put their necks on the line. Those who were what? Who had received the fullness of the Holy Ghost. You know, namely, for example, the 144,000. <laughs> you see, that's, that's one of those places where I was telling you earlier. He always relates it. So he talks about the fullness of the Holy Ghost upon corporate house of Israel is prophesied to occur at the regathering. Well, what he's talking about is if you go to Revelation chapter 7, here is the regathering, right? The, the without number, right? As the sands of the sea. This, this is what he's talking about. So he's talking about it coming on what he believes is the 144,000 first. However, the 144,000 are sealed just before the great multitude rapture comes in. So how on earth is it the 144,000 who are receiving it before the great multitude rapture and they're going to bring all of them in? It's impossible. That's not what's happening. We know that the 144,000 will help bring in the great multitude, but it's after the first remnant group, the, the, uh, um, the Priscilla's and Aquila's, the Church of Smyrna, the remnant workers, the Luke 24, that group that works during seals, who have the access to the throne room, who have the fullness of the Holy Ghost, who will receive it at Acts 2.0, having been given the light of the Lord, refined in the fire of the 40 days, to then be ready and worthy to receive it, at the time of 2.0. That's what's going on. It can't be the 144,000. It's impossible. And that's why I say it's because of a seven year understanding. And as we saw right there in Romans chapter 16, it's the mystery. It's the mystery that most haven't understood. They've seen where pre trib is in parts of scripture. You can point to some of these things. Even though some people are pointing to mid-trip things, there are other things that they point to that are pre-trip because there are scriptures for it. But they don't understand the mystery of it relating to the beginning. That's the mystery being prepared for a group of people. Even though those, the rest who don't understand the mystery will still be part of it if they're in Christ, spirit-filled right now. That's the pre-trip group. They are the mystery. And the remnant are those who will be revealed at the time of the end that the creatures were waiting for. The second group, the, the, the mark group, the great multitude, the light portion, 
are waiting for the manifestation of these sons of God, the mystery to be revealed. We're warned not to be deceived by empty words and that this is actual uh, false teaching within the body. And we're also not to entertain those that would peddle them, these false words, these, uh, these false teachings, and those that would adhere to them. Because again, leaven is very contagious. We're to have no fellowship with the fruitless works of darkness. And again, this is such a broad statement. You know, I, I'm not going to dwell on it. Go revisit last week's teachings. I mean, I've done whole teachings on statements like this in the past as well. Unity or division is a litmus test of what spirit one is led by. Jude is very clear that those that cause division do not have the spirit of Elohim. So if you're, so this in the context of having no fellowship with the fruitless works of darkness should be a pretty powerful statement. But unfortunately, we in the West, especially in the modern age, we've gotten very soft. The spirit See, and there's something to be said about what he just ended with about the West having gotten very soft. Because we saw that when the Lord comes for his 40 days, what is he going to bring? He's coming to bring division. But is he coming to bring division in an unfruitless way? No. He's coming to bring division by bringing the truth. And that truth is going to cause division. You see? But when the remnant are there with them, are they going to bring about the division? No. No. They're going to go to those who have been divided, those who are against the others, to bring them back together and to show them the truth in the light of the truth of it. But the Lord is going to bring division by bringing the truth first. Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of Yah. This is, it's, you know, when it says a root shall come from Jesse, and it's speaking of the millennial reign here, and it's saying that this is the, the outcome of being... Uh, to have the fullness of the Ruach upon us. This is how Messiah will judge and make decisions. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we seeing this in our lives? Now, again, to really make the point that we're not void of the Ruach, I do see wisdom increasing in this community. I do see understanding growing. I do see the ability to give good counsel growing. We're yet to see might, I think, in its fullness. Do we see knowledge? Yes. Now, the fear of Yah, I don't see a lot of that. If we're truly honest with ourselves, we're, we're in the process of learning to fear him. So this is what I want to conclude uh, in terms of what baptism points to. Uh, we're actually going to go full circle back to the Torah. I decided to leave this for the ending because I believe that the Torah foreshadows actually one of the greatest weightier matters of baptism. Let's look at the shadow picture uh, regarding the ordination of the priesthood. This is the Levitical and Aaronic priesthood. This is the task you shall do to them to set them apart to serve me as priests. Take one young bull and two rams, perfect ones, an unleavened bread and unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. Make these of wheat flour. So what, is, what harvest is wheat associated with? Sorry, what appointed time? Shavuot. And I made th I've made this statement in the past that prophetically, in terms of the fulfillment of the appointed times, we're in this place between Shavuot and awaiting the fulfillment of the fall appointed times. And you see, a lot of people, that's what they think, that, that we're, we're in between this time, like, the, like it's not going to begin at Shavuot, but they think it's just the fall feast. So because the Holy Ghost came at the true Feast of Weeks, then it's the Feast of Weeks, it doesn't need to continue from there. We're in this period in between Feast of Weeks and the Fall Feasts, and they think then when it all begins, it'll be the Fall Feasts. You see, they haven't understood that it will begin at the Feast of Weeks. It will begin at the Feast of Weeks, that the, at the true Feast of Weeks. They, they've missed that. And so what he does is he mixes Feast of Weeks with Shavuot, because that's what the whole world does, right? The whole world counts seven Sabbaths from Nisan. They get to Shavuot, sixth or eighth, and they call it what? Then the 50th day, and that's Shavuot. I mean, that's, that's not only uh, Shavuot or Feast of Weeks, but when the Holy Ghost came. However, there is no wheat that's completed seven weeks of harvesting, and there are no grapes. It's not, it's not the end of the grape harvest. 
Not even close. You see, and this is this is where the world has missed it. And when you understand that it's to the Feast of Weeks, the true Feast of Weeks, and then 50 days, you understand where all these things are playing out. And within what he's saying, you see, Look at this with wheat. So you have this make these with wheat flour, which means just as we know the feast of weeks, when the harvest of wheat, when the seven Sabbaths are in, what do they do? They crush that flour, right? They crush the wheat and they make flour. They make loaves of bread and so forth with it, right? At Shavuot. Well, we're seeing that it's being made with wheat for, for the priestly line. He, he himself also said, that it's connected to Shavuot. Well, to be truly at Shavuot, you have to be at the end of a, of a wheat harvest to make that bread. You have to be at the end of a wheat harvest to make that bread. And he's talking here about a priestly line at wheat harvest time. It's directly in relation, as he's saying, to true Feast of Weeks, true Shavuot, which is not Pentecost, but true Shavuot. That's where everything begins. True Feast of Weeks. And its connection is to a priestly line as well. And what are we talking about here? We're talking about a group that's been taken pre-trib and a remnant portion of wheat that's remained. Those baked with leaven, that's the pre-trib going. Who remains? A priestly line of wheat. A priestly line of wheat. What do we know about this priestly line of wheat? Well, we know them from Acts chapter 15, right? We know that this remnant group who are the priestly line, they are disciples. They're the Priscilla's and Aquila's. They're going to be the Gentile line. Because they're going out during the age of the Gentiles as well. We're in the Gentile age, and the Gentile age goes until the end of seals. And so what do we see? Let's start in Acts chapter... Let's start in Acts chapter 15, verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through uh, Phinus and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Let's go to... Verse 5, but there arose certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them. Okay, they wanted to circumcise the Gentiles and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth their hearts, bear them, the Gentile, right? This Gentile remnant, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Or remember that? The apostles get it first at the beginning of 50 days, right? After the pre-trib. So the, the remnant workers are warned. The pre-trib happens. The Lord returns on the same day after the pre-trib, anoints the apostles, and then when he returns, who's the one? Who are the ones with the Lord? The, the remnant workers. Then at the end of 50 days, the Holy Ghost anoints who? That, that Gentile group. The ones receiving the, the fullness of the Holy Ghost of Acts 2.0. Um, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, now, therefore, why tempt you, God, to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? See, the disciples, them, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. And all the multitude kept silence, gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And then we come to one of the famous verses we used to talk about a lot. Verse 14, Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. 
and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. You see? It's to the Gentile age. It's prophetically revealing to us the Gentile disciple workers in the Gentile age before the Lord returns to rebuild. It's so awesome. It's this remnant group from the wheat who are the priestly line being anointed. And so this is really interesting. Unleavened, now notice what the priests had to bring as part of their offering for ordination. Unleavened bread. So think of um, the typology of someone that is able to rightly divide the word without contaminating it. They've got no guile in them. There's no falsehood in them. Mm. That they can bring forth from their mouths unleavened bread. Think of Yeshua being the bread of life, him being the word, you know, the word Messiah and not tainting this. Not only that, it's mixed with oil. These are people that have been put through the fire. They've been crushed and the outcome has been oil fit to be put on the altar. Pretty wild, right? I just think you're seeing a beautiful typology of... Um, this mature harvest coming through. Remember you had the, the barley harvest and then you have the uh, wheat harvest. And Shavuot points to a people that have already come into covenant. Specifically, it's, it's uh, the message going out to bring back the house of Israel. You may now come back into covenant. You hear that? It's a people going out to bring in the house of Israel. You see, this, this first wheat portion, that's why I say it's this mystery of these portions that they haven't quite yet understood, that he hasn't understood, and, and most none of them have understood. It's this portion of the wheat that is ready, that is in covenant with the Lord, that is gone. And it's a remnant portion of the wheat that has remained, being anointed with the Lord, being without guile, understanding the revelation of the Lord that's given through the Spirit of the Lord to go and bring in the house of Israel. Awesome. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket along with the bull and the two rams. Then you shall bring Aharon and his sons to the door of the tent of appointment and wash them with water. This word, chachatz, which means full body. This is part of the immersion process. So you're seeing that to be fit for priesthood, you had to be bathed. You had to be baptized. You had. You see? When I started studying this one and hearing about this, it all started to make sense like I was telling you guys earlier. When I started to understand this, I hadn't realized that it was, it was the priesthood. It was this priestly line that the baptism was first initiated for. And here I was having saved doing this baptism teaching again. Not understanding why, but I thought it would be best if I kept it later. I didn't really know why. Now I do. I absolutely do now. It's a preparation of this priestly line that we've been preparing this whole time. It's time to be baptized, if you haven't, in the name of Jesus. In Acts 2.38, now's the time. This priestly line to be washed with water before it all begins. Had to be immersed, and you had to be able to bring an offering fit for the king. Now think of the spiritual sacrifices here, your offerings of praise, your service to the body, your wisdom that you can share with those. Is it pleasing before the king? Is it offerable on the altar? You shall take the garments and shall put on Aharon the long shirt and the robe of the shoulder garment and the shoulder garment and the breastplate and shall gird him with the embroidered band of the shoulder garment and shall put the turban on his head and shall put the set apart sign of dedication on the turban and shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. So who is Aaron a typology of here? Of Messiah. Messiah is our high priest. And we see here in the typology that it's Aaron and his sons that become priests. Now, do we have lingo in the Bible of becoming sons of Elohim? Yes, it's all over it. This is a big part of the plan of redemption. Now, notice here that Aaron is having to do this as well. Just like we were talking about, right? This set-apart group who will be what? The sons of God. Who will suffer as he did. 
to be glorified together with them. It's the same group we've been talking about. Well, as, the, as his sons, did Messiah come and show us the way? Yes, he came. He said, come follow me. He, he's not asking us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. What is he going to do when he comes for 40 days? Come follow me. Just like we've been teaching in previous videos. Come follow me. Sell what you have and follow me. And just to give, just to let you know as well, this again, this anointing, this is what it means to be a Mashiach. It means to be anointed. Then you shall bring his sons and shall put on, put long shirts on them and shall gird them with girdles. Now think, what are we to be girded with? The belt of truth, the belt of righteousness. Paul goes on about. Huh. And shall gird them with girdles. <laughs> Here we go again, right? And to gird them with girdles. We see that same thing. And thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put bonnets on them. And the priest's office shall be theirs for what? For a perpetual statute. Let me go look at this in, uh, in the Strong's. Was it Exodus 29? Okay, da, 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 for a perpetual statute. Vanishing point, conceal. Time of mind, olam. Okay, not what I was thinking it might be. Because perpetual, by the way, perpetual is uh, is the letter noon, right? The fourteenth Hebrew letter, fifty days. Remember that? It's the fourteenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the number fifty in the Hebrew uh, number system, and it means perpetuity, perpetual. Okay, everlasting everlasting 14 50 50 days 14 years and there's a group that was told at the beginning of the 50 days to what to be girded about with perpetual because this girded about group of the priestly line is going to be what in an everlasting covenant with the Lord. They will be priests, as you're going to see in a moment. They are going to be priests forever. So do you think that just because they've died, having put their necks on the line, becoming seeds that bring up more people because what they witnessed in somebody's death and brought more people in, do you think that, oh, now they're no longer priests? No. They will forever be priests to the Lord. That's why they're part of the resurrection. That's why they're part of the resurrection. You're going to see it's an everlasting covenant. Uh, you know, the armor of Elohim. Aaron and his sons and put turbans on them. The priesthood shall be theirs for an everlasting law. So you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. So this is part of the ordination of the priesthood. Now, if you jump, um, before we go there, notice that it's everlasting. Now, think of the statements in the book of Revelation that those who overcome shall rule and reign with Messiah. They shall be priests of Elohim. So I, I believe this, uh, the, you're seeing baptism being foreshadowed in the Torah as part of the ordination of the priesthood. So you have to ask yourself, what's baptism truly about from like a bird's eye point of view? Leviticus 8, this is when they actually go through the motions of ordinating the priesthood. Okay, so... <clears throat> he mentioned there, you know, for those that overcome. Well, no, that's it, it's much more than that, isn't it? So he, here he was relating it for what he thinks is connected to the 144, which we can prove and have been showing this whole teaching and have shown throughout the ministry in many teachings that this girded about group who is perpetual, who are a perpetual statute of priests for the Lord. He goes and relates it to chapter 20. Well, chapter 20 doesn't say for all of them. It's not for everybody who, who overcame. It's for those who put their necks on the line, who will be resurrected to reign with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests 
of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. Who are the ones who are taking part in the first resurrection? Who are the ones on which the second death has no part? It's not everybody that's an overcomer. It's Smyrna. It's Smyrna. Those who put their necks on the line, those who will be in prisons, some of them will be put to death, but they will receive a crown of life. Want me to show you something that's pretty wild? I showed this in the forum today. This word crown, which is Stephanos, right? A badge of royalty, a prize in public games. Everybody knows, right? The Olympics are on right now. Do you know when the Olympics end, Lord, uh, brothers and sisters? They end on August 11th. When is the end of Shavuot? Right here. The Olympic Games, where people are receiving these public games awards, as soon as it's over, or within a day, within hours of it being over, there's going to be crowns prepared for a group of people. And it's right after the prize of public games. That's pretty wild. Now watch this. So in Revelation 2.11, listen to what it says about them. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. This is the Smyrna group. This is the Priscilla's and the Aquila's. These are those who put their necks on the line during seals, who are the priestly line, who will receive the crown of life, who will take part in the resurrection, having suffered as Christ did, to be what? To be to take part, to be glorified with him, who will sit in his throne with him as he sits in the fathers with his, ruling and reigning with him for an everlasting covenant because they are the priestly line. The priestly line is to be what? Baptized. It begins with them. Then the fire. The fire to endure so that they can receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost at true Pentecost before the red horse rider is then released. Moshe took the anointing oil and anointed the dwelling place and all the... Okay. So now from there, let's go to... Where am I? 23 and change. Now let's have a listen to here. We're going to be in Leviticus chapter 8. And I know there's probably a lot of people that would like me to get into other things that have been going around lately about Leviticus 8. I am not going to go into it. I know there's already division in relation to what people believe on one side or the other. I'm not going down that. I do have a belief on it, uh, 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 an, uh, an idea on it, but I'm not going down that road. This is about the priestly line in general. And we know. That the priestly line, look, we know who they are. We know that it comes from the John the Baptist type. And the John the Baptist in the end of days is the typology that plays out as Moses and Elijah. The Elijah company. That's who our focus is. Just like I've told you, the Moses company. I don't know who that Moses company directly is. Might there be some of us that are actually Moses company and not Elijah company? Sure. But I believe everything that's happening here in this preparation is the Elijah company. But guess what? Moses and Elijah are together. They're both the representation of the priestly line. They both represent the two on the road to Emmaus. Moses' works and those with Moses is when... He comes back and he takes them into the wilderness, right? They, they were taken into captivity first, right? What's going to happen during the first half of seals? They're being taken into captivity. They're going into captivity. Then he's going to lead them out of that captivity. And they're going to go into the wilderness. They're going to go into the wilderness. Just like Mark's discourse, the captivity comes. The, the World War III and the craziness. And then the beast comes. The mark of the beast, then it's the fleeing into the wilderness like Moses' portion that we've taught on many times. And then you got Moses and Aaron and his sons. You've got that portion of the priestly line through them while this portion is doing other work. This one is probably the one leading them once they're in the wilderness. Leading them once they're there to, to follow the ways of the Lord and to be, to be diligent and to, to be repentant and not to stray while they're there. 
while these guys are probably more out in the world. These might be even leading more with the with um, rulers. Whereas this is dealing more specifically with the people throughout the world and bringing them maybe in to these places of protection. It's two groups, but they're all the priestly line. Do not go outside the door of the tent of appointment for seven days until the day. What? Days of your ordination are completed for he fills your hands for seven days. Uh, what was that? You just heard that, right? It wasn't just me. You heard that. Leviticus. Let's go over here. Leviticus chapter 8. Remember, I told you guys we were going to get to that part about the seven days, right? Remember this seven days? I'll just do a brief recap for you guys. We know that the seven days is connected. Actually, let's go to Luke chapter 12 first. We know the, the seven days is connected as I showed you, showed you earlier. All the places which relate to him coming on the eighth day. The 40 days beginning on the eighth day. We know he pre-told them just like we just saw in the Old Testament there in Exodus 29. That the loins of this priestly group would be girded about. To be girded about and ready when he returns from the wedding. He's talking to the servants. He's not talking to the whole world of spirit-filled uh, in Christ's people. He's speaking to his remnant. Those that he chose from among them that will serve him. It's what? He's told them to be ready, to be girded about. When he returns from the wedding, we see that the wedding as we've known, just like we see from Leah in, in Genesis 29, the wedding is seven days. This is that Gentile wedding. I, I've told everybody, everybody who gets taken pre-trib, when you get to that wedding feast, you do not sit down in one of the highest rooms. We will all sit down in the lowest room. And if anybody is there to be of honor, they will bring them up. Somebody will come and get them and bring them to the higher room. None of us should be caught in the higher room and have to be brought down. Okay? What happens after the wedding? There's a banquet. After the seven days, there's a banquet when the Lord comes out from his chamber. Just like we showed in recent videos. And a feast is made for them. And this is the feast of him coming when he returns on the eighth day. Look at who it's for. Those who will be recompensed at the re resurrection of the just. Who are those taking part in the resurrection of the just? The kings and priests. Who are they? The ones who are Smyrna. Who are what? Ordained. Who are told to be girded about. Just like Exodus 29. To be girded about. As that priestly line. Who's about to be anointed at the time of the wheat harvest. With the wheat wafers. Will endure the fire. To receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You see how it all lines up? It's, it's, it's insanity. It's crazy how much it lines up. And now look what happens. Now we go into Leviticus 8, and we've wondered about, okay, well, those seven days, are we going to be gone? Are we staying? I've always said we're going to be staying. Look at what it says here. This is to that anointed priestly line. And you shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, remember, that's because they had the temple back then. We are the temple now. So what is it saying? You're not going to be going out of, of who you are. We are the temple. The temple is within us. So we're not going to be leaving this body. And as I said earlier, does it mean maybe we will be, we'll also be, you know, in our homes and just hanging out there for seven days? Maybe. I don't know. But we will be staying here within our bodies. We have to stay for seven days. It's directly in line. It's exactly what we've been showing. A group girded about having to wait for seven days. Can't go out of the tabernacle. And you shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days until the days of your consecration be at an end. Okay? That fulfilling portion, that having received it, being readied. For seven days, he shall consecrate you. As he hath done this day, so the Lord hath commanded to do, to make an atonement for you, 
Therefore shall you abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night seven days and keep the charge of the Lord that you die not for so I am commanded. See that? So what do you think should happen during those seven days, day and night? We're to keep the charge. You think maybe that means praying? I mean, could you imagine this, the Spirit of the Lord just came and revealed himself to you, let you know you've been prepared to remain, be girded about and ready when he returns from the wedding. You know now to stay there for seven days. What do you think you should be doing? Praying, diligently seeking him, just in prayer for people, in the word, studying. That's why I wonder if I may end up doing a teaching in that time. I won't just do it. It would be based on what the Lord reveals, on what the Spirit leads me to do in those seven days. And it just, you see, this is why I shared that at the beginning. I had shared it in the past, but it just so happens that in this ministry, those are the numbers. That, that 628 is the full immersion of water baptism for a priestly line. And the following teaching that if I'm led to do it is about the Lord returning on the eighth day. Like, th th this is an happenstance. This is all of this that has happened for almost seven years. It's not just by chance. When every single part and piece connects over and over and over again. Just like, just like our sister Hope. Our sister Hope, 18 years being vexed. And bam! Just a month after we did the teaching of having found that revelation of the things that surround the, the, the mustard seed. All of these things are happening now. All of these revelations are taking place now. All of these connections are happening now. It's not by chance. I could promise you, it is not by chance to be ready seven days. I believe you're seeing a, a big why of the plan of redemption here. What is, what is the role of the Bride of Messiah in these 7,000 years of the time domain? To become kings and priests, notice that they, they've been commanded, you're not allowed to leave the temple priest. Now, I'm going to jump in here with something else <clears throat> because I want you to know that everybody, you see, when I've been talking about this pre-trib, everybody going pre-trib has this same typology. They are all kings and priests. And it dawned on me when our brother Roy shared this with me a couple months ago. He, everybody going pre-trib is everybody in Christ spirit filled. They are all a type of priests been redeemed. That again, this relates to the, the, uh, uh, the water baptism, the receiving of the Holy ghost, even though it's not in the fullness. That's why I've always believed, and that's what I've taught, that everybody going pre-trib will have been baptized in Jesus' name as Acts 2.38. That's why I've always taught it. Those that want to hum and haul when everybody in the New Testament has been baptized in Jesus' name, even after Christ was gone, after the anointing of the Holy Ghost, they were doing it all the way through. And, and some people think that it's not necessary. It's absolutely necessary. And the Spirit leading them gets them to do it. But not everybody will. Well, just like not everybody's being prepared to go pre-trip. It's, it's, it's an anointing, guys. And within it, there is a remnant chosen to remain. And they are the ones that will receive this trial by fire. They're going to receive more than those who had lived their lives in the trial by fire that they went through. Because they're going to receive not just the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, which was like, like he was talking about, which is even though, yes, the Holy Ghost is in us, we see it there in the scriptures. It's not to the fullness. It's this remnant group who are the ones who will receive it to the fullness. 
because of the serving that they're going to do in this time of the end. Precinct. You're not allowed to leave from the courtyard. You must stay there and serve. I believe you're seeing the job description of the Bride of Messiah of Priests and Kings here to serve in the tent of Elohim, which we are. They're not to go out of that. So again, even in the typology of what he's talking about, when he's talking about these seven days, I think there's something to this as well because he goes beyond saying seven days. He's also talking about in the prophetic seven years. You see, he thinks it's only seven years. That all the tribulation is only seven years. And he thinks it's the 144, but we just saw. How could it be only seven years and, and the 144 if the great multitude is immediately after them? It's seven days, of course, which is the relation to the wedding. But days can also be prophetic for years. And this ordination that's coming when it's complete in the seven days for this remnant group when the Lord returns, how long are they remaining for? The seven years of seals. So there is a typology as the days that are also the years. And it's funny because we see this, this same type of thing play out that we've shared a number of times in Luke chapter 9. That when you see the six days as years in Mark and the six days as years in Matthew, they are related prophetically just to the years. Only Luke's has a dual typology in it where it's not only the, the eighth day, meaning when he returns from the seven-day wedding in the 50-day count and coming out about an eighth day, but in the big picture of prophecy of the 21 to 22 years, it's about an eighth day, meaning it's, it's not quite the start of the eighth year. That only plays out in Luke's. And you'll remember we shared this even in Genesis. I used to share it a lot a while back. That if you go to chapter 8 of, of Genesis, you see once the 40 days are done, then you've got the picture of the 50th day, which is when the dove goes out. And then you see what? And stayed yet seven other days. Those that haven't seen this, look at the word stayed. Pain, travail, tribulation. The tribulation begins in these seven days, which are seven years. And then this end of seven days as years, the Holy Ghost goes out, the dove goes out, and then you've got the branch or the leaf, which can also mean branch, plucked off, which is another word for rapture, to be plucked, right? It's the great multitude rapture. And then what do you have? Stayed yet seven other days. This word stayed actually does mean to wait. So you've got seven other days, which are years, but they're not repeating. This seven days is the seven years of seals. This seven days is the seven years of trumpets. Just like Mark's six days are six years of seals, Matthew's six days are the six years of trumpets before the comings of the Lord, but only in Genesis 7, as you have only in Luke, where the about an eighth day is a dual day count and a year count, you get the same thing in Luke, uh, in Genesis 7. For yet seven days, and then it came to pass after seven days. You have the dual use of this seven days, but they're the same seven. One relates to being after seven days at the coming of the 40 days. And you've got another one, which is a prophetic picture of seven days as years, like the other two in chapter eight. It plays the same story as it does in Luke. And it's, it's wild to see that he brought this up because these seven days are the seven days that we're talking about that connect to Luke. And he's talking about them being a typology also of seven years because that's what they would remain for as this remnant group of Luke who are remaining to work for seven years during seals. Pretty wild how it works. This means that you need to ask yourself the question, what is the purpose of these 7,000 years? That means that even the millennial reign is part of this ordination process. People ask me, are we going to learn more things during the millennial reign? Absolutely. And I believe you're seeing it all type of... And so see, when he even said there, what about even during the millennial reign? 
Well, that, that's what he was talking about, and that's what we showed. That remnant group who will rule and reign with them, they're going to be there reigning with them for a thousand years. So it does also include, because it is a covenant with them as priests forever. ...here in the Torah. What is it all about? What is this plan of redemption about? It would seem that baptism plays a key part within all of this. For our cleansing and hopefully for our ordination to be of service to the king. Yah has commanded to do, as he has done this day, to make atonement for you. Stay at the door of the tent of appointment day and night for seven days, and you shall guard the duty of Yah and not die, for so I have been commanded. So, ask, you know, people say, well, what's my purpose in life? I believe you're being told here. Are we guarding his duty? You know, why does Yeshua use parables of the wise and trust, trustworthy manager or the wise and trustworthy servant? who blessed is the servant who is found so doing when his master returns. Because when he's found so... Just as we covered, right? Who is found so doing when his master returns. The exact same group we're talking about. Exactly the same. ...doing, the master shall gird himself and make hit the servant sit. And the master shall... You see, that rings a bell too, doesn't it? This same group and everything he's talking about. He doesn't understand the differences in the Gospels and the remnant groups of workers. Yet he's talking the same places, the Spirit is leading them in the same places of understanding. Because it, it's in him, he, he understands the Scriptures, but he doesn't understand the revelation of the Scriptures. You see, this is the same story we've taught on many times. When the Lord tells them when he will return from the wedding that they would be ready and he will come and sit down and serve them, it's only the one in Luke's gospel. He doesn't do it with Mark's. He doesn't do it with Matthew's. And you see in Mark and in Matthew's where they sit down and eat. But he doesn't sit down with them and serve them and eat with them. Only happens in Luke's. And that's why in, in Luke chapter 12, it says, And if I come in the second watch or in the third watch, so blessed are they. That's the Mark group and the Matthew group. When he comes at the end of seals for the 144 and when he comes at the end of trumpets for the 12 tribes that go out during the millennial reign while the kings and priests are ruling and reigning with christ in the millennial reign he only does it right here and it's in luke 24 30 and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them this right here is the lord it's that prophetic picture from chapter 14 when he returns from the wedding and has that meal with them. That's it right there. Funny that that's where he's leading it in his words. I'll tend to him. These are huge words when you understand what Yeshua is really saying. Absolutely. So what's, our, what's the point of this time domain? I actually believe we're seeing who will stay at the door of the tent of appointment and guard his duty. What is the tabernacle? We are the tabernacle. Do you see what's... This is one big sifting process. Who will be priests? Amen. And Aharon and his sons did all the words that Yah had commanded by the hand of Moshe. Baptism is a big part of this though. So I know that people kind of understand intellectually that baptism is a serious thing because they go, well, it's about coming into covenant. And it's like, but even that thinking on its own, they don't do it justice. Because even if, you, if it is about coming into covenant, which it is, just that on its own should be feared and revered. Because once you do that, there's no going back. This means that someone coming into covenant has to really know what they're getting themselves into. Because, you know, baptism of fire coming, headed your way. But hopefully people are starting to appreciate truly how, what a fearful thing baptism is. It's about the cleansing of leprosy. It's about the cleansing of a house. It's about the ordination of a priesthood. Back to Exodus 28. There I shall meet with the children of Israel. This is the tabernacle it's speaking of. And it shall be set apart by my esteem. Again, think of what the tabernacle is, spiritually. And I shall set apart the tent of appointment and the slaughter place. And Aharon and his sons, I set apart to serve as priests to me. So think of Peter's words, you know, that we've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light to, be, to become a spiritual priesthood. What's the duty of a priest for seven days? They're not allowed to leave the guarding and service of the tent. Let me spell it out. I think that those that are being called to be kings and priests, 
They're to guard the duty of the spiritual tabernacle. They serve the body. And again, serving the body. Like... Did you hear that? And serving the body. And serving the body. When you know that the church is left behind because they were sleeping, because they were caught up in the things of the world, and you know the great multitude is the Lord's group of the house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in, which is in the creation of the light portion, which is his group, which, like he said, I am not come but to, but to, uh, um, uh, uh, but to save the, the house of Israel. In Matthew chapter 15, that's his group. That's his group. There, there, there's still a body to be saved. An arm? No. A leg? No. The body. I don't want people to go, oh, well, I'm not a teacher. There's many kinds of services, as Paul would say. Many kinds of ministrations. The most important ones are the ones that happen one-to-one -one behind closed doors. The giving of your time, the giving of your wisdom. What I do is just one tiny portion of what there is to serve. So don't condemn yourself. It's kind of like what we were talking about before. You know, yes, there are things, even in the now. You know, like he's saying, what he does, what I do, it's just a small piece. But it's individually sharing with others what Steve is doing on a greater scale, what some do in spiritual battles. You see, there are all these things that are the now. But we always relate this in relation to the is to come. And in this is to come, that's what I was talking about, <coughs> excuse me, earlier, that there's people here in this ministry, and I'm sure in other portions, wherever the Lord is preparing them, that aren't just going to be standing in, in large groups and, and, and revealing and teaching and reading them. But there will be those going into the streets and bringing them in. There will be those that will be fighting the spiritual battle against these the, the demons and the enemies that are trying to, to prevent these people and to come against us. There will be those working with the women, with the children. All these parts and pieces make up the whole of this group serving the Lord as priests and kings. Until what? Here it comes as I get ready to close it out. I shall dwell in the midst of the children of Israel, and I shall be their Elohim. Where else, or with what big thing in Scripture do we see this language, I shall be their Elohim? What does that get attached to? Someone said covenant. The renewed covenant. If you see throughout Scripture, if you guard my covenant, you shall be my people, and I shall be your Elohim. Okay. As I bring it to a close, let's pay attention to what he just said. So now you can link this idea of covenant. And is there a renewing of that covenant? Yes. You see, we have shared that there is this renewing, this new covenant that's coming. And this group of priesthood is working through it until that time. When do we know that time is, brothers and sisters? Let's go to another very exciting piece of scripture that we've shared over the years that a sister a few years ago shared in the uh in what was it in the uh, uh, uh septuagint translation that was absolutely mind-blowing because we knew that jeremiah 31 was talking about the time of the great multitude rapture the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals which is that group. Remember, Abraham was promised that his descendants would be as the sand of the sea. Well, surely it can't just be the house of Judah, 14, 15 million people that are Jews on the earth. It's the house of Israel that is scattered throughout the world and the Gentiles are grafted in with them. You see, that's the great multitude. And now listen to what it says. We know that the great multitude comes in at Passover or second Passover of the seventh year of seals they will have seen him come he will be here he'll destroy the enemies then he seals the 144 and the 144 helped bring in the great multitude at passover or most likely second passover but it is passover that they come in because they're the other weed harvest they're the spring wheat that is ready in the fall and when that wheat is brought in it can't be used until passover Although I think it'll be second Passover yet to be fulfilled in the following year, 
in the, which would be six or seven months later. And look at what we got starting in Jeremiah 31, 6. For there shall be a day that the watchman upon the Mount of Ephraim shall cry, Arise you, ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. Why? Because the Lord is coming, what? On heavenly Mount Zion, the, the, the mountain carved without hand that destroys the image of the beast in the toes, and it crumbles, and it becomes a great mountain. That is Mount Zion. The Lord is coming with paradise to receive his great multitude rapture that he said he was going to prepare a place for them that when he returns, he will receive them unto himself. That's the great multitude rapture going to paradise. The second taking. For thus saith the Lord, sing with gladness, O Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, publish ye and praise ye, and say, Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together a great multitude shall return. And verse 8, when he gathers them in the Septuagint, the original translation, the first translation, it says at Passover. It is absolutely amazing. And what do we know? We know that the Lord has now come as the Messiah ben Joseph, the high priest king, who takes over as the true high priest and king that Aaron was. And when he takes over, he is the greater. He is the Melchizedek. He is the Messiah ben Joseph, who is also, you could say, Messiah ben Ephraim, because he is the firstborn. And look at who we see. Jeremiah 1, 31, 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplication. I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Remember, who's the father of Ephraim? Noon. Noon. Right? Noon. Perpetuity. 1450. Everlasting perpetuity. And look at what he says. It says they will come with weeping and supplications. And I will cause them to go by the rivers in a straight way. We see this even in 2nd Esdras. You guys will remember this. This is the priesthood, the, the, the pre-trib. When the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth, and then bewilderment of mind will come on those who are left. And then they're going to plan to make war against each other, which means the 50 days, right? There's 50 days before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, that comes at the end of 50 days. And then it goes into the things that you had seen before. Then will the Son of Man be revealed. And when he comes, an innumerable multitude will come desiring to conquer him. This is from 2 Ezra, uh, I think chapter 13, starting in verse 29. By verse 34, this is where they want to come conquer him. This is the Ezekiel 39 war. And where is he going to stand? On the Mount of Olives? Nope. On Mount Zion. And Zion will come to be made manifest, prepared, and built exactly the wording in mark when the last supper when he says go and prepare a place for me and it'll be a place prepared and built right a place prepared sorry prepared and furnished only marks says prepared luke's is furnished and matthew's is completely different this is when he comes in john 14 the place prepared where he's going to receive them unto himself. The mountain carved without hands. And look at the assembly that comes to him. Once he destroys all of them by the word of his mouth, right? And it says, or, or which is that first sword. It says in verse 39, And as for you seeing him gather to himself another multitude that was peaceable, these are the ten tribes, hello, which were led away, from their own land in the captivity of the days of King Hosea, whom Shulam answered, the king of the Assyrians, led captive. He took across the river, and they were taken into another land. What happens when they're brought back? And they went in by the narrow passages of the river Euphrates, and the Lord is what? He's bringing them and stopping the channels of water as they're being brought back. That's exactly what it says. At the time of the rapture, he will lead them back. 
and will cause them to walk by the rivers of uh, by the rivers of waters in a straight way and it's the lord who's doing it verse 10 jeremiah 31 10 hear the word of the lord O you nations and declare in the isles far off and say he that scattered israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock therefore shall they come and sing in the height of zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the lord for wheat because remember the great multitude is the spring wheat coming in at passover or that's been harvested but can't be brought in until passover after they've what ezekiel 39 war seven months cleaning and for wine right the hundred forty four thousand, and look at where they'll be shall be as a watered garden because they're going to paradise and then listen to what happens listen to what happens <clears throat> jeremiah 31 31 and the days come saith the lord that i will make a covenant now that i will make a new covenant sorry with the house of israel and with the house of judah not according to the covenant that i made with their fathers in the day that i took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of egypt which my covenant they break although i was a husband unto them saith the lord but this shall be the covenant that i will make with the house of israel after those days brothers and sisters here it is at the end in this conversation of the ordination of this priestly line who will be here till the end of seals seven days as that prophetic type while he's gone to the wedding when he returns them being given the understanding as he has that banquet meal with them being anointed as priests put through the fire to receive the anointing of the holy ghost to have the fullness of the holy ghost of what we have been calling for years acts 2.0 who will serve during the seven years of seals and when it's all over it'll be when the lord is dwelling with them in heavenly mount zion when he makes a new covenant with them an everlasting covenant this is that covenant that we have taught on from the book of daniel that he makes after the seven weeks right the seven shabuas the seven years he makes a covenant and that we know he has to break because satan is cast down the pit is open messiah cuts gets cut off after the temple has been built and he has to break that covenant like like uh zechariah chapter 11 says and then satan and all of them have two and a half years to that cause chaos and craziness and then the two witnesses are killed at the end of two and a half years at the end of 13 years total tribulation and in that 14th year when it begins how does it start Daniel chapter 27 in the final year the Lord renews that covenant that he had made at the beginning of trumpets which was what at the end of the seventh year of seals in that half an hour of silence in heaven that's when that covenant is made with all people brothers and sisters this is a bride remnant being prepared it is a priestly line to be baptized to receive the anointing to to be ready in the revelation do you think as i've said many times do you think the lord is going to give the revelation to a group of people in the final seven years of the last generation and give it to a group of people only to take them all home and say now i'm going to train up another group who has never heard of it absolutely not because as in heaven so upon the earth brothers and sisters we are a remnant group being prepared do i think everybody in the ministry is part of it no i think there's a group enjoying the revelation and being strengthened in it but will still be taken and i believe there are several hundred maybe even a couple thousand within the ministry who are a part of this remnant priesthood being prepared all across the earth and the signs are everywhere the revelation of prophecy from genesis to the from the beginning of genesis to the end of revelation are the evidence of it brothers and sisters 
I'm excited as always. It is so beautiful to see the Lord's words be revealed, to have the understanding and to bring it forward, not only to strengthen myself, but to strengthen everybody he brings to hear and to receive it and to understand it. We are being prepared and we are shortly about to know. We are only a fortnight away, brothers and sisters. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. I can't wait to meet you all, whether in the third heaven, lowest room, prayerfully having been accounted worthy, or whether here, waiting for his return after the wedding, to have a banquet with you in his, with him in, his, in our presence. I can't wait. We'll see you all soon, one way or another. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Bye for now.